I would be in that interview chair for four hours and then I would go home and stare at the ceiling for four hours. And they don't realize that they go about their day, they go back to New York, right. whatever, but I'm over there now having to, because we just dug it all up for yeah. you. And here yeah. you go, I served it on a platter. So <laughs> afterwards too, when I would go home, sometimes I would try to do something before going home, but when I would go home, it was really hard for me to allow my children to touch my body. And like, I start having an active panic attack. Wait, because your baby's because in you the car. Because you just took my baby mm -hmm. into those gates. Like oh. I would never have done it myself. Mm. Yeah. So like, I'm like, oh my God, he just did that. He just did that. I felt like when the show was ending, I had so much hope that the order really was changing. Mm -hmm. You know, you keep hearing All of you just laugh like, that's hilarious. So that I have that same hope. It's too big of a problem yeah. for me to be carrying this load alone. Mm -hmm. I think oh, yeah. I went through a lot of therapy to free myself of that responsibility. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. It is, it is not my responsibility to change this group, change this community that I happen to have been born into. How you guys all went back and forth with, do we go with the show? Do we not? Mm -hmm. I had left thinking that they wouldn't cut me off. And it was when I got contacted, it was right after my mom had told me, you will never see your siblings again unless you come back. So I was like, well, I, I'm going to burn this place to the ground. Yeah, I don't I don't have any reason <laughs> like light mm -hmm. the match. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see all of our faces today, there's so many, please go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, do all the YouTube -y things for us. Liking, subscribing helps boost the algorithm and obviously leaving those words of encouragement for all of our guests today. Guys, this is a super special episode. We're in Malibu currently with most of the cast from Escaping Polygamy. Let me just say hi to everyone right now. Thanks for coming, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have Amanda Ray, and then we have over here Chanel, Andrea, Jessica. We're in Malibu because Amanda here put together this amazing women's retreat for ladies who have escaped polygamous cults, and she was kind enough to invite me, and so I crashed like the whole thing. And we were like, you know what? This is a great opportunity having everyone in person. Let's film something together. Let's talk about the show, what it did for your mental health, if it was difficult, if it was easy, anything that stood out to you, any behind the scenes things that you guys want to talk about. And then I think what everyone wants to know, everyone in my comment section at least, is like, what are they doing now? We want updates because so many people watched your show and loved it. So the order, and you guys can please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, a fundamentalist group from the LDS Church, which is the mainstream Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, such a long name, or LDS for short, or Mormon for short. So they were a break-off that continued to practice polygamy, and then as different leaders became in charge, they started practicing incestuous polygamy and having just hundreds of kids, and it's very overwhelming. There's um, a lot of illegal things going on, like tax fraud, child labor. There's a lot of abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, what did I miss? They all just the completely, abuses. Know, yeah, yeah, they completely control your life. Emotional, mm -hmm. everything. They control yeah, your logical. money. They have their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So objectifying women, abuse. objectifying women, financial abuse. So I just wanted everyone to understand, if you're not familiar, how tightly controlled this group was and why it's such a big deal to leave it. And so when they're talking about, I left and I hadn't seen you in 10 years or six years, it's because like most high control groups, when you leave, they completely demonize those people and say, well, they're clearly led by Satan or don't trust them because they don't want the, the best for you or they're going to try and drag you down and you're not going to go to heaven and be with your family forever if you follow them or talk to them. And so there's a really, really hard rule of shunning and excommunicating your entire family when you leave this group. And so it's uh, that really hard place of Obviously, all of you women were not happy and you did not want to live polygamy. You didn't want to marry your cousins or whoever. And we did episodes with you, which were incredible. And Amanda, we're still working on these two guys. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so really dire situations. And so what happened is they eventually got together and created this show, Escaping Polygamy. I guess, where should we start? Let's just start talking about what it was like filming. Does anyone want to jump in first? 
I mean, I guess it was very, because for me, I think I had a different experience filming than you girls because I had just got out of the order. And then literally months later, I'm get, being contacted by the producers. But I was grateful for, I was talking about this a little bit earlier, but I was grateful for the opportunity that Escaping Polygamy gave me to be able to be in contact with you guys. Mm -hmm. And to, uh, I didn't even know you two because you had left so long ago when I was so young. But I knew Chanel because she had married into my family, so we had a little bit of a bond. But to be able to be connected with family, cousins, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, because I had been freshly out, I think it impacted me so much to be able to see how progressed, how, how healed, it, or I guess how healing looks, mm. how healthy looks. Because Jessica had been out 10 years at that point that I met you, I think. I think I remember asking you. You probably don't remember this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was, it was it close was to that. Way, what what year so was it? You, you leave? It was 2013 out. when we yeah. started. Yeah, I was 2013 when I left. And then I think I met you around 2014, maybe. Yeah, so it was okay, like yeah. nine, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I just hit my year 11. So I'm like, I hope that some girls, because we had a lot of young girls on this retreat. I'm like, I hope some of those girls look at me the way I looked at you. <laughs> but yeah, I think that was one of the, the biggest pluses was being able to uh, not only get to because when you're fresh out, you're in survival mode. There's There wasn't times where I was like, oh, I can just, you know, get off work and come hang out with all of you guys and have a healing moment. No, you don't have that opportunity. And in this case, they were helping it to happen, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. You're still trying to, like, move forward in your life. Like, what does that look like? What do I do? And then to, like you said, pause and just, like, let's just hang out. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of time for that. And then also when you're fresh out, that's considered idle time and – you want to have productive time and you want to show the order like I've left and I'm going to make something better of myself. And so it's just a lot of internal conflict in those mm -hmm. first years. Yeah, yeah. I'm so healthy. To, and I feel so bad even in the moments there was times where I was like, I think I'm annoying Jessica because we I they would book separate hotel rooms and I would always go into Jessica's <laughs> room and I would be in her bed with her and I would ask her questions to like two in the morning because I, it was all it was like reading like in the order it's like the bible right but for me it was like a bible of like healing right oh, yeah. like how, so how did you handle this situation how did you get to this point so yeah. and i remember her you were so good though i was like am i am i being annoying you're like no i completely <laughs> welcomed it because i feel like when we left there was so much isolation mm -hmm. when we left there was a few people out before us but everybody was off and living their own life trying to figure out their own life we weren't communicating or staying together one because cycling through our traumas not knowing how to have a healthy relationship um but it, even still we were trying to think about how many people are before us that were single mm -hmm. like women who were available not like families or mothers out trying to take care of you know their family situation there's not really a lot that we can think of mm -hmm. and then we were on our own for a long time and then people started slowly leaving mm -hmm. but it's like how do we bring them in our lives how do we like you don't want to overwhelm them to where yeah. they're like, yeah, these people are crazy. <laughs> yeah. You've Especially been taught so many things about exactly. us. Yeah. Yeah. How do we share yeah. that? Right. Welcome you. Like, I welcomed it. I loved that you'd come in. I'm like, yes. <laughs> That's Family. good to know. It felt like we just fell right back into where we left yeah. off. Because I would have done it either way. <laughs> but it's good to know you didn't get annoyed. <laughs> right. I feel like the show actually helped bring us together and like see and create the community that's out here because even though I had been out for a few years like I hadn't seen Andrea for eight years until we literally met up to start talking about filming the show and like Jessica I'd seen her a few times but we weren't like actively in each other's lives like we hadn't seen each other for however many years before mm -hmm. I left so then at that opportunity uh, to be able to like talk to each other is like we we kind of did, but it was more like, well, where do we even stand with each other anymore? Because this is a whole different world, a whole different scenario. And, and, and what has changed with our relationship in all that time? Because once you leave, it's just an automatic, nope, you're gone. We don't exist anymore. <laughs> like the friendship is just like. I would love to hear kind of the origin story of how producers contacted you or who started it and who was like, OK, I'll be the I volunteer as tribute to be like the head of Satan, right? <laughs> like to do something that is so actively against the group, not just leaving, but speaking out against it. And what effect that had on you with your family or, or whoever, once you actually decided to become the face 
of being against the order. So you're like nodding like, yes, girl. So like, yeah, there's just like so much to it. I mean, yeah. I want, I, sorry, I'm just curious, all of your guys' answer to this. When you were asked if you were gonna be a part of it, were you like, hell yes, I want to expose no. the order? No, no really? I, no. Yeah, I was, I was really scared. It was Jess originally, I think she was the first one that was contacted. Yeah, then- I was sent a Facebook message and I'm, um, they said they wanted to do a documentary and was looking for consulting services, not for us to be the face of the show. So I called, talked to them over the phone, met them, talked with them, asked um, Andrea, and then I was like, well, we have Chanel. I know I'm not really close with her yet, but I really want to be. I felt like we wanted to always create a community out here where somehow um, showing like by, by example, living a life, showing what we could do with our lives, and then hopefully it will help other people want to leave but I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know if I was ready to do that. I had these pressures of like, I need to wait until my life is in a perfect place. I need to wait for the end of the story. All of those things where I felt like I could be ready for it. And so I felt like in the moment, this was just kind of playing out where, you know, we were contacted. What does it look like? Okay, they came and chatted with us after hearing more about, I guess chatted with me after hearing more about it. They took it back to the network producers and stuff. And then they came back and said, hey, they actually really want you to be the face of it. And I was like, "Uh, nope that's not going to work out for me. (laughs) And that's a hard no. And so then um, they asked, you know, why no? And things I came up with, like, well, I don't want to expose other people. I don't want to take advantage of other people. They're at a very vulnerable time in their lives. That's a lot to share. I don't know if I would have loved my life at that time being filmed. Um, There's a lot to figure out after, you know, coming from the order. So they helped with um, kind of I guess, what do you say? Calming some of those fears by... Yeah, I think a lot of it was kind of just giving the like, um, like where I was coming from, right? I mean, we were also like in our early 20s, right? Yeah, we we were were still going through, I was going through my master's program, bachelor's and master's, you were going through pre-law and law. Yeah, I was, I had just, it was, I was, I think end of undergrad about to like maybe, I was going to go to law school, but I hadn't started yet. Um, And then it was just the idea of uh, like speaking out, being exposed to just, going back there emotionally like for myself it was like yeah. I had gone so like so much growth and like had done so much of my life like away from that world and so like reintroducing it or like getting it back into my everyday life it was mm-hmm. like a really big like scar that was gonna like I was like okay is because I don't you know like I don't want to talk about like an open like f- festering wound like <laughs> and so yeah. I was like okay has this healed enough for me to be like I can talk about it in a way that is this is something that um, I went through, but it's not something that I'm like going through in the same vulnerable way. Um, and then it was, it was also, I mean, it was like when we were of course younger, when we got out, it was, it was just the two of us and we didn't have control over our story. It mm-hmm. was, um, it was all over the news. You know, I would go to school like in just when we initially left, right. I would go to school and it would be like current events day. And there's like my mom on the newspaper talking about like my situation. And so the teacher would be like, oh, you can go to like to the school therapist for this class period. Right. So I was like, oh, okay. And so, um, which of course I welcome. It was like, get me out of here. But, um, and so to be like having that experience where I was, I felt so as a child exposed to the public, but at the same time, like I was the one at that time when I, when I was 12, right, speaking out and saying like, I gotta get out of here and and all of that. And so I was like really wrestling because then it had been 10 years later for us, right? So I was- Well, and we took so much hate and meanness and hurt from the order over those years, like multiple people over the years. And you try to like reconnect, you try to rebuild relationships and you try to just keep it safe and you just take it and take it, hoping that one day it pay off. And then I feel like even we started to, I started to rebuild some relationships with people who were inside the order and just telling them like, it's fine. I don't care how you choose to live. I just wanted that connection of having some sort of like my family back in my life as I was moving forward and I was feeling settled in my adult life that I was tolerating some of the negative aspects in a way. But starting a show and speaking out like that, I was gonna lose it all. Everything I just built up and got to, I was risk losing it all. So some of the things that like when they were like, well, here's our kind of our our reasons for no, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. It was like, well, as much as that was vulnerable and scary, like as a, a child, right? It was like, well, look how much we exposed it. I mean, that I think about like, oh my gosh, like our our older sister that left, the way that she exposed it in a way that became like this news 
that made it a little bit easier when we left. And so then when it was again, more public, just shining a light on everything that's happening. And it was like, okay, really that's like, yeah, it's scary for me, but like the way the public's going to view me, the way that's going to go, um, people aren't going to look at me like, oh, you, you came from there, gross, go away. You know what I mean? Like people don't, that's not how I'm going to be viewed, even yeah. though that's how, because you have that shame spiral um, as the one that was like, you know, victimized through those situations of like, what's wrong with me? How did I let this happen? You know, all of that. Yeah. And so to be like, okay, that's this, it's okay that my story is shared and it doesn't mean that I'm a forever victim. It's I'm a, you know, like I'm thriving, like I'm a survivor and I've gone through a hard thing, but. I feel um, like we came up with a phrase that kept carrying us through every one of those hard times. And that phrase was, if it makes a difference for one person, then it's worth it. Yeah. It's a yeah. small sacrifice. I guess it was a huge sacrifice. It felt like in the moment, but it was just, if you know what, we can do this and make a difference for one person, it'll be worth it got really annoying over the last, you know, the nine years trying to explain when people find out it came from polygamy. Oh, so you were like long dresses. Oh, oh so you like yeah. thinking about your life yes. and yeah. very yeah. assuming about my life and recognizing that more information needed to come out about the various groups and start shedding more light on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it just kind of evolved over time. And eventually we got there where it felt like, okay, I can do this. I'm feeling comfortable and I'm ready to be vulnerable in that place and just let let the future play out. I've took these hard steps before. I left the family in the situation and I'm okay with where I'm at. So I'm gonna do it again and I'm hopefully gonna be okay with where I'm at. Yeah. Trust myself to carry me through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, I, I wanted to expose them. I wanted to expose the polygamy. I wanted to expose the abuse. I wanted to expose everything, but I didn't want to be the one to do it. I wanted mm -hmm. the, <laughs> like, the media company to be the ones to do it. And I didn't realize that you know they would want me to you know me to come out and be the face and tell the story and um but i feel like in a lot of ways i was i was only because it hadn't even been three years for me of being out when we started the show so mm -hmm. i feel like in a lot of ways like i was still living in it like it was still active for me my mom was still part of the group i was still like actively fighting you know for certain relationships um where at, at, but obviously a ton of most of my relationships by then had already been like cut off and everything. And I was still holding out hope that they would um, like in the future, my sister um, would like maybe in the future, you know, it's been a decade, our kids are grown and they're less concerned with all the order stuff. Maybe we can be friends again. But I knew that doing um, like doing the show, Escaping Polygamy and going public, that meant I could no longer have that hope for certain individuals if they ever if they stayed. I can never ever have that hope again. And like, I don't know, but in that sense too, like I, I, I've kind of reminded myself that throughout the years, so many, so many people have left the polygamous group at different ages. So like my mom, for example, when we started the show, she was still in the group. I really did not think that my mom was gonna be leaving. I mean, I wasn't surprised <laughs> Daniel kicked her out, but I really didn't think that she was gonna be get, you know, like that would be the end of her her membership. But you think about it, like she she was what, 50? My aunt was in her 50s. Like even even if it's not today, I do still have hope for, for the future, whether they mm -hmm. do decide to leave or if like, if we never have contact again, maybe one of their children in the future would wanna leave. And just knowing that they have a family member out here and just seeing that we've been able to come together and talk about the, the problems and expose them and be like, yeah, but we're all standing up here um, like validating everybody else's experiences as well because we were all taught to, to hide it to lie about it not, not even like even with our own siblings like we weren't for for many years we weren't even supposed to realize that we had the same dad or you know so everything was so secretive and hush hush that like i just I wanted everything to come out. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like that's where while. I was sick of the secrets too, that I was like, you know what? These are their secrets. I'm not mm -hmm. in the order anymore. I don't keep order secrets anymore. Right. The truth yeah. is just gonna go out there. And if you guys don't like it, then change something. Mm -hmm. Here's your mirror. Here's yeah. what you've been doing. Here's what you look like. Here's your feedback. Now take it and do what you want with it. Yeah. And every time our mom would reach out or say like, are you proud of yourselves? Or kind of like, you know, yes, just like yes. this, <laughs> yeah, this back-ended compliments in ways, but the, and, and I don't know, sometimes I think she is proud of us, but I, every time was just like, if somebody else would tell the truth, we wouldn't have to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That would mm-hmm. be great. Someone else take it and run with it. Mm-hmm. We did have, remember we had that lunch with mom. We yeah, were like, we did. We told our mom before we were, when we finally committed, I guess I also wanted to back up that we were already kind of helping people leave. Well, I don't know, if, people would reach out consistently at different yeah. stages and then just like, what's next or how to do this or just connecting them to resources out in the community. But I was afraid to go in and be there myself and cameras helped create that safety barrier for mm-hmm. me to be there more more of a supportive Physically. role. Yeah, yeah, because I lost Physical some people presence. where, you know, somehow we were gonna they were gonna leave and then I was waiting at the end of the street and they never showed up and I couldn't get a hold of them and I just like, well, I guess I lost one. Yeah. And the the other part of it is is um I mean, just the resources. Like we were like realistically, yeah. if we we I didn't have the financial resources <laughs> yeah. to take care of the people that were leaving in yeah. the ways that they needed. Mm-hmm. And so did so, the show help provide for that? The show, a, that was to a degree, and that was part of the yeah. deal that the first you know, few months, even somehow getting them set up in some way, whether it was right. getting a house or apartment, something covered for a few months, access to therapy if needed, mm-hmm. 100% like informed consent. They don't have to do this. Anything they say no to, they don't have to do. And I do feel like some of that that line was crossed a little bit with production trying to, you know, push a show and get the rawness out there. But that's something we kept trying to advocate for is everyone to have their voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And think- we were we were like a really like strong unit of like if we're helping somebody and if they're not interested, if, if at any point like they're not interested in this um, being public for them, right. if this is like anything felt like it was exposing somebody, we would be like, we're just not going to participate, which it was. And they knew that. Right. So mm-hmm. it was like it was um, respected in a way that and the other part of it, too, just as far as being resourced, it's not it was par- a lot of it was mm-hmm. them because we're just two people, right? And like, we're just, yeah. no, four people. Like, it's for having like a whole team of people to say, okay, well, who can we find in the community who is providing these resources for people leaving, you know, DV situations? And, and it was like, at that time, I hadn't considered, oh, it's a DV situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, DV shelters are for women from DV. We're from polygamy. It was like, oh, that's the same. Um, <laughs> I feel like another aspect that we said at the time is that we need security. I currently regret mm-hmm. that. But I do feel like that that was something we said. We need security. We need some sort of um, something to feel safe when we're going into these people's homes. Why do you regret that? I regret how it's turned out. The security? Yeah, the security is like now like he's, he just made himself famous. He did. Hold on. Uh, plot twist. I don't know about this. So <laughs> what happened there? I just feel like that, you know, we had a whole show with multiple women who are we're trying to empower women and they move forward with a show where they found the white guy that their white man became their primary power like are we talking that's true are we gonna say the name of the show (laughs) show. it's hard because i should i i'm in a mixed review like i i support the show and i always support stories getting out there and i have complete support for authenticity raw real but it is very interesting when you start to see someone's um their end goal was for self promotion that it, you just feel really used. Got it. Yeah, there's that, but I would say that wasn't necessarily. Um, I don't know if that's how it went down. That's how I feel. Okay. And there's a lot of it's like so a, a lot of moving parts to that, right? It was there's there's this uh, this production company. They have different people that are working. Whoever's working that day is the one that's doing whatever they're doing. And then different people came in for different roles. And then the ones that you know worked with them and they stuck around. And then it, as anything goes, people are there for their their own reasons well also too with the security it felt like that was the one person that was in the the pocket of like this creating the show to what they wanted for example like if they wanted us to say something and we wouldn't say it they would get the security guy to say it Mm -hmm. or um if they wanted us to do something then we wouldn't do it then like the security guy would just like go and like let's just take the air out of these tires and create problems in the show that were just like this is stupid you guys are creating these problems enough already exists That was my experience with it. And also, too, I did not like when the security guy would talk over us or would they would be like, say it with more oomph. And he would be like, and I'd be like, I am not going to sit here and get yelled at like this. Yeah. But that's how it was being received. To create urgency in some of the scenarios. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And just how do I navigate through this? It was all happening in real time. But it was a great I mean, it's a great moment to continue to practice speaking up and saying like you don't have to talk to me like that we're good mm-hmm. yeah i hear you i think 
There yeah. was a lot of moments where I felt like, because uh, again, I was so young, so it's fresh out. And then Rachel says she had the same experience with Andrea. She was so grateful Andrea mm -hmm. was on her episode because she felt like, and and I I can, um, I'm not saying that it was the producer's fault, da da da. Yeah, but they were creating a show and trying, yeah. you know, they could see the big picture. I I respect that. But I do sometimes feel like they could have been a little more aware that these these women are so fragile right now mm -hmm. and they're so brainwashable and you have to ask them for consent and you have to are you good with this are you okay with this what if we you know give yeah. them more can you please model mm -hmm. what consent looks like can you please yeah. help them find their voice like this these moments in their life can make or break like the directions that they're going or the right. struggles that they experience yeah so rachel says with with that one there was one scene where um, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So she says she was so grateful that Andrea was there because she didn't know how to stand up for herself and they were kind of just directing her. And so they were so like, to her, it was a lot because there's these strangers telling her what to do and, and how to portray herself on TV. She's never been on TV before. And so then I think you grabbed Rachel and you were like, you don't have to do any of this. <laughs> and she was so grateful because she would have just like had a panic attack without you. Yeah, yeah. I think there's like a moment in that scene. Um, it was the photography sh shoot thing mm -hmm. that she was like wanting to. And it was supposed to be this like super fun, exciting thing. Right. But it was like, oh, but she and I, we we hadn't seen each other in a very long time. So it was like, we met up there and it was like, oh, we're supposed to have this like, oh, we're like, we're these like fun girlfriend, like da 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 mm -hmm. things, but like, we don't know each other, right? And so <laughs> I'm like holding her and like, hey, we're gonna get through this day together. Like whatever it's gonna be, it'll be, but like, I've got you. And like, and that's where like, there's a, like later on as she's going through it and we were like doing the thing. And I felt like an idiot where like, I was supposed to be her model. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I hate Cause, this. Cause I get the but, point, like they were, she had wanted to do photography yeah. and my dad said no. So they were trying to give her this gift, I see. but it mm -hmm. was in such a, um, stressful environment yeah. mm -hmm. and she felt so much pressure and you were there to like kind of help her but then it got to a point where they all didn't understand why she was crying mm. and you understood it yeah and there was she a was overwhelmed it was mm -hmm. uh, yeah it, then there was a moment I, I don't know if it was on yeah i'm just like holding her and then like, it is like her she does talk about it in one of her interviews like during that episode of like mm -hmm. it was a lot and you know just just to have this experience of trying the thing she wanted to try, but then like, what does it look like? And uh, yeah, it was yeah. an overstimulated. So did they yeah. ever have, because these are people who are obviously coming out of traumatic situations. Mm -hmm. Some may still be in a fight or flight mode, a survival mode. And you guys are like, hey, and then these cameras, did they have anyone who was trauma informed on set or did that fall, the burden fall on you guys to be the therapist? We were the trauma informed. <laughs> oh yeah, the God. burden fell on us. We kept asking for it. And they kept running into, you know, one way or another. I feel like they were like, we can help set up some therapy this way. And then it was, um, it's also hard too, because a lot of us coming out of these groups, the way we are taught to look at therapists is one either like witchcraft or they're gonna brainwash you, manipulate you. And so a lot of them, even though we were trying to encourage it, were afraid right off the bat. And I had to respect that because I was also afraid. Right. When I first had therapy, I was very like, very like apprehensive, very against it, sat there for my full hour, multiple sessions, said nothing, um, didn't trust the therapist and had to keep going because I was minor and it was part of my court case, so I had to go and recognize that that was how I felt initially. So I, I understand if they're not ready, but more or less that there is a therapist when you are ready. But then it's also hard to ask for that when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we pretty much, I feel like there was, there would have been no way we we could any one of us could have done it alone. Mm -hmm. Like being able to have a team mm -hmm. and we like switch off so it's not like one person has to be there for every event, but right. then you're never alone. You always have a friend. And I think that really helped out a lot. Like there was there was one point that we were driving past the the Damon Palmer building. That's what the order members know it as, but that's their church. Mm -hmm. If you've seen it, then there's like a black fence all along the the mm -hmm. parking lot. Um at that point, so I do I do want to say um, I really appreciated that during filming, they, the producers and the media company, they allowed me to actually have my baby with me so that I could nurse her. But there was this time that we were driving by then, um, my baby and the babysitter were sitting in the car with the security guy. And he was like, oh, I got to check this out. So he drives into the, into the parking lot and like I start having an active panic Wait, attack. Wait, because your baby's because in the car. Because he just took my baby mm -hmm. into those gates. Like oh. I would never have done it myself. Mm, yeah. So like I'm like, oh my God, he just did that. He just did that. And then like, so the producers behind the scenes were like, get their baby out of there. Yeah. And so like 
you know, in that moment, <clears throat> like he got out of there and reunited me with my baby. And it was just like, obviously, Chanel can't film for a good hour. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Sorry. There were <laughs> a, lot a lot of, of moments like mm -hmm. that where it was like, oh, you just made the decision for us now. Yeah. You know, and it or felt a sudden trauma reaction within ourselves that yes. was completely right. unexpected. Exactly. In that scenario, I, I myself would not have chosen to take her on their property right. behind those gates. Like, and I, I'd hate to use the word that they were insensitive. I just think that they just they didn't, didn't realize know. this was yeah. our life. This is yeah. this is not fake to us. This is real shit and this is real trauma. And I guess that I don't maybe we should have I've thought about this before. Well, maybe entertaining to other people. Yeah, but yeah, not to I us. I felt like that where I was like I am not people's entertainment. Stop yeah. pulling that out of me. Yeah. I am not here for someone's trauma voyeurism. Why am I feeling like I'm feeling like that's like a puppet what I'm in the show? To do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd have to kind of recenter myself multiple times. Yeah. I feel like if I did it now, it would be very different. I feel like I can navigate that stuff a lot more or a little bit, at least a little bit better than what I did in the moment. But mm -hmm. also the experience gave me a lot of growth. Yeah. I was about to say probably we can navigate it because we've done it before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think they realized too. There were so many times where we were, well, I don't know if you guys had this, but I would be in that interview chair for four hours and then I would go home and stare at the ceiling for four hours. And they don't realize that they go about their day, they go back to New York, right. whatever. But I'm over there now having to, because we just dug it all up for yeah. you. And here yeah. you go, I served it on a platter. So <laughs> afterwards too, when I would go home, sometimes I would try to do something before going home. But when I would go home, it was really hard for me to allow my children to touch my body. Right. It was like, they'd come up to give me a hug and I was just very like overwhelmed. Like my body was just like the whole thing tingling, mm -hmm. very trauma reacted, but you know, survival for the, making a difference we're mm -hmm. gonna make a difference we're gonna do something here we're um just kept pushing myself through it yep. and over time luckily my second daughter pushed past that she's like i don't care if you yeah. need to relax i need a hug and she <laughs> pushed me through that and helped yeah. me find my way to still be able to in allow someone mm -hmm. in my personal space when i am very trauma active Right. Because it's not something I could do. You know, typically someone's hurting and you want to go give them a hug, but giving me a hug, it was like, it it was so unsafe. I couldn't, yeah. I had to go right back into protective mode to be like, mm -hmm. is this a safe hug? Mm -hmm. Not decompressing. Yeah. It makes me feel like we really did have the perfect group of girls because the fact that even though we were going through all of that, we saw the end goal. Mm -hmm. And just like that, if it helps one person, this is all worth it. Cause we know what it was like to not be able to, there was nothing out there and that we really did believe, oh, you just basically live in the streets when you leave. <laughs> I feel like we stayed as a strong united front too. Yeah. That there's not anything that afterwards that I was upset about or any drama that came up or mm -hmm. anything where I felt disrespected by anybody. Mm -hmm. It was if anything didn't feel right, we called the person who would also be involved. What are your thoughts about this? Kept each other in the loop consistently, kept, you know, running group thread text. What are our thoughts about this? Yeah. Hey, they're asking me this. What should we do? Mm -hmm. Just, and I think it made it difficult for them, it did. <laughs> but it made not it for really us. hard for them. But it, I think that's also what helped it not turn into just a big well i don't think it would have turned into a cat fight by any means but you know like mm -hmm. heading in that direction where it turns to a, a reality tv show or a documentary where people just they they create divides between them mm -hmm. i honestly honestly there were a few times i wondered if they were trying to create a divide between us really? yeah but i, I wonder and i can't remember the scenario right now i just remember it actually happening and i had to sit back and be like is this in my imagination or is this like are they actually doing this intentional because and sometimes it was one person specifically or sometimes it was just the scenario altogether but I, I, but you never know. And I couldn't help but like, just be like, well, I can't trust my, my own flipping family. So I don't know what's happening with fil filming. Like this is a whole mm -hmm. new world mm -hmm. that like the media company and like going public and everything. Um, I can't be anonymous anymore. And so I think a yeah. lot of it was just like, I didn't, I didn't know if I trusted. I didn't know if I'm like still trying while actively doing it, still trying to figure out if you know, if I'm being manipulated or used or like if they just, you know, whatever. But I, I do think that um, all in all, like, I feel like uh, most of the people that we worked with were very, were very respectful and they like they understood that sometimes they just don't get it. But we're going through something right there. And mm -hmm. and 
I don't think that I don't I don't want to believe that they were trying to be like malicious and cause this mm-hmm. divide. Yeah. What I think is they had their goal and we had ours and it was yeah. conflicting a lot. And so they would side with the people that were more on their or try to get people on their side or to, to see their vision. But we had our vision. And I do remember one time it was the one time I stood up and I was like, you can't talk to me like that was one of the producers was it was in Rachel's escape and Rachel was having cold feet. And I was like, hey, is there any way that we could figure out something else that's going to help her feel more stable or figure out like I don't know maybe give her a little bit more money because this is a huge like she doesn't know where she's going or like what she's going to be doing if she's going to have a job blah 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 and then they um uh, flat out told me like well if it's if it's you that's like they were making it sound like it was me and they were like we can just do the escape without you and I was like you absolutely cannot she will not show on those uh, you know this she will not show up Mm -hmm. on that camera without her big sister and how are you going to record that you guys luring her out without her big sister like I was pissed that they even suggested that to be though in the end in a way because in the what beginning, anyone who left, like there was a lot more where we were involved, we were closer. And then towards the end, it started to feel like there was a disconnect that was happening. Yeah. A disconnect with what? Just a, the people we, that were escaping, that they were going through a producer first and contacting the show rather than the natural way of the going to us. And it started to feel, in the end, kind of started to head into like, I mean, it was still naturally unfolding, but then yeah. afterwards, like while we were in scenarios or going through things, there was already this bond created with a producer. And so when they were struggling, they were turning to that producer. Right. Who and we you knew felt a little Had a different mm-hmm. end goal. Mm-hmm. The goal was a, a good show versus, yeah. you know, like your overall mental health and complete connection. Yeah, sense mm-hmm. of self. And it was hard because if you're trying to create something, but it's all unfolding on camera, it was, it just made it harder in the end. Yeah, I think so, because I was younger, it was a little more confusing. Yeah, so there were sometimes where I stood up like, and said that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, this is my family. I do feel like we had to say that so many times. And that reminder, like, this is my family. Yeah, and my sister's not going to trust you more than me. I don't know what made you <laughs> think that, <laughs> but yeah. I'm also going back onto that one topic of how you guys all went back and forth with, do we go with the show? Do we not? Mm-hmm. I was also I. 100% was like, and I think it was because I was angry with my family at that time because I had left thinking that they wouldn't cut me off. And it was when I got contacted, it was right after my mom had told me, you will never see your siblings again unless you come back. So I was like, well, I, I'm going to burn this place to the ground. Yeah, I don't I don't have any reason. <laughs> like light mm-hmm. the match. <laughs> and I, it was also like, I know how I felt in all these situations. So I'm going to just expose everything so that if there's another little girl in there that feels those feelings, she knows how I, even though they're going to demonize me, they already have. It's already been done. I do also think that made it really hard during um, like filming and some of the emotions that were coming up or just different things is that we were getting noise from so much directions. Mm -hmm. We were getting noise from the producers, the end goal, the, the network's end goal. We were getting noise from fans and people who like flooding our social media accounts Mm -hmm. and seeing us on the streets. And then we were getting noise from people who were in polygamous groups, people who were our family members or are our family members, but giving us even that more shame and that more hate and that more like trying to activate that internal, like get back on the Lord's plan. And it's worse, it's bad to leave the order, but it's worse to talk next. Slander, like, yes. God's kingdom, yep. And just having all of that brought up on the inside and trying to keep it all managed because mm-hmm. when I would be in an escape or in the moment, I would remind myself like, this person is my focus. This person having a good experience, this is their real life, this is their their experience getting them through this and helping them get to a stable place. That's my focus. I'll go home. I've got a supportive husband. I got a supportive family. I'll go home and I'll fix myself or like recenter myself after. And so she's really zoned in on the person and then would go home and be like, what did I do? Like, what did <laughs> yeah. I do to myself? And take a minute to get back on track. I want to mm-hmm. talk more about the mental health aspect because all of you so far, I've been hearing a lot of self-sacrifice and I think that's also something very common when you leave a group like that is it's hard to get rid of that self-sacrifice and obviously you're doing it for the best of intentions with these people who are leaving, but I feel like from what you're saying, you may have sacrificed some of your own mental health and your own physical health for these other people. I mean. 
huge sacrifice. You're not just going to pick someone off the corner. You know, you're talking about these mm-hmm. interviews that are putting you on the floor for hours afterwards. So how did that really affect you? And do you feel like you were in a good enough place to do that? Or if you were to do it now, would you do it differently? I think like for me, like I was going through law school for um, like pretty much the whole thing. And for that piece of it, I will say I was, it was very, very respected of, I was like law school is my priority. I'm not, I'm not going to like fail at that just to do this thing, right? right? And so that was really, really respected as far as my availability and what I was able to do. And the impact of that though meant that I would have to do quick turnarounds. Um, I mean, there's like just a couple episodes that we did, like Jennifer, for example, it was very sudden. It was right before finals and it was like a really big, you know, um, emotional thing for me. But it was like, I really had to like disassociate basically to be like, okay, I'm gonna spend the weekend doing this and then I'm gonna go in finals. Like Whoa. that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And it was super big picture for me of like, I am not, these people are not taking my future. Like there's no way that, and when I say these people, I'm talking about the order. <laughs> of, um, <laughs> they're not like, I'm going to help, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do but I am not going to let that take my future. And so, but in order for me to survive through that, it was like probably not the most healthy way to do it, right? Of like, just shut it off. And um, I mean, it it impacted a lot of things in um, my socializing. Like I didn't really like make a lot of friends or do that sort of like participating in like the environment of law school because um, that was just one more thing to right. worry about. Too and much I was like, oh, I don't have time for that. Yeah. But at the same time, I was building my reconnection and building family. And like, that was so much more important to me anyways. Mm-hmm. So it was just like, whatever, right? I'm going to do what I'm going to do and, and do that part of it. Um, but and, and for me, it was emotionally being able to like fly back to Washington. You know, it was like I like I pop in for the trauma and then I go home Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that was just like physically to remove myself from the situation was like another way, I mean, to do it. But it was hard. It was definitely um, a lot of growth. And I don't let me think about I was I I know I was in 10 years of therapy, but yeah, I was done by then. So I did my therapy from when I was 12 until I was 22. Um, No therapy for this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, for me, I think that in a way it kind of put me back into survival mode and I didn't realize like I was, you know, I was going through the triggers and the traumas and I didn't realize the effect that it was having on my body or that I was checking out on myself. And so I had gotten um, like a, probably a year after we started the show is when I I got to a very low weight and I had to get on like three different scales and be like, OK, fine fine, I accept that this is the situation I'm in. I'm like, you know what, it's, I, I just can't do this by myself. I clearly need some help. So I went back to therapy and started seeing a psychiatrist again. And had I, like, if I could do it over, I would have started the therapy like in the beginning. I wouldn't have waited <laughs> the whole year. I, I would have started it in the beginning so that, you know, it would have been. Was you afraid to smooth. start it? Or? Therapy? Yeah. Is no, that why you I had I had been in therapy before that in the past. Oh. It's just, just like I just realized you'd be so triggered yeah. and you need it. Yeah. You just survive, survive. And like, oh, I'm not surviving. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. in a way that I was still in a way like like I lived really close to my mom. She was still active in it. And we, we still had like the family drama and I would, you know, whatever. So in a way, I was like I wasn't in it. But my life, it was it was still in my life, like very actively in my life. So I didn't realize like it wasn't going to be like a whole jump to me. It was just like, oh, yeah, I do this every day. This I'm just going to go more in depth and then suddenly have the world know who I am, which was the hard like one of the really hardest parts for me is like now I can't be anonymous. Now Mm -hmm. I'm literally coming out here and be like, guess what, guys, I was in a cult Mm -hmm. and I married my cousin in that cult. Like, and, and then to have have whoever do whatever with that, right? Yeah. There's some people that understand and respect and get insightful, you know, stuff out of your story. But then there's other people like, oh, you're the polygamous girl? Yeah. The, you know? Well, so I literally like I literally did have an experience where some random chick was like, like, she knew who I was. And then she started trying to use that against me and was just like, you grew up in polygamy and all that nasty lifestyle and like whatever. Mm-hmm. And I was like. 
yeah but i left that and like trying to use my past against me like that says a lot more about you than it does about me but i was really shocked to like (laughs) see that actually play out but some people really do like i honestly i not all fans were positive and supportive Mm -hmm. yeah some shaming some like how do i get in there Ugh, that men, sounds like yes. a great life for me, mm-hmm. especially think, some men. For <laughs> Mostly me, men, yeah. one of the hardest was was the people who were like, oh, it's all stage, it's all fake, it's all, oh, and I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, my, what? My life is a lie? I didn't, I didn't create this community for the show. Yeah. Like, we, yeah, we call them up and we're like, oh yeah, hold her down, we're about to get there. Like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Right. Well, even when it came from people in the order and they were saying things like, you guys are just a bunch of actors and they'd call us like reality stars and just it 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 cut deep yeah. and it hurt and it felt like, well, I don't know how to act. So I guess if I am, then I guess whatever, really I'm doing a great job. But like at the same time, I guess there is an a- acting aspect to it that we all were trying to hold it together when on the inside we're completely falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. And there yeah. was that aspect to it. Yeah. Um, what was it like for you then the mental health and the just the daily struggles of going through everything for me I knew that I was in a unique situation where I did have such a support group outside of being in um in the filming part I I don't want to be like oh I had I had my husband and I had you know like try to really highlight that you need a partner to have a healthy life or supportive but I did have a really supportive situation where I had um, like my mother-in-law last minute, whenever I needed anything for my kids, she was there. My husband very supportive. Um, so I had a place that I knew that I could safely fall. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like I could give almost anything in the moment because I knew I could go somewhere and safely fall. So I really focused on what is needed in this moment. What is this you know, person escaping need from me? And how do I just zone in on them in a lot of ways? But if I didn't have that, then I think I would have been a lot more guarded. Yeah. Um, and I also like, even when it came to the filming, I I really liked working with some of the producers because I felt like I learned so much from them as far as professionalism, women in um, like a professional role. We didn't get a lot of that exposure. And there were mm-hmm. so many times we'd watch them converse with each other or tell like what people should do or talk with the network on the phone. And we'd be like, oh, wow. Like we were mm-hmm. just mesmerized, like soaking it all in. Like, okay, I just got some skills there. Okay. And then we'd come to them with some of our personal life. So as a professional who's running a business or who's a producer who's doing this, how would you um, handle this situation? Or we'd be like, oh, so that's how rich people do it. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. That's how that's how a you know privileged person lives life. All, All right, right. Now I can do that. When they clean their feet off before they got in the car. Yeah, they <laughs> get in there like cleaning their feet off. And we're like, what? Never done they, that yeah. before. No, no. Yes. And they made me realize too. <laughs> we like completely live like <laughs> just so uncivilized you like, you poor to people. Snow. You gotta yeah. shake it off. Yeah. I just Yeah. I remember them looking at me too when I wanted to um because we would go out to lunches in between takes or whatever, or after we were done interviewing. And I would just always like, we got to box up all of our food because that was where we mm-hmm. came from. It was like, you never waste food. And I remember yeah. them looking at us like, that's so weird that you guys do that. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like that experience too helped me almost, I don't want to say class, like a, but an upper class or like a, just another way of living. I was so used to One you know, way. getting the, the cheapest thing on the menu yeah, or going to these lower class places and then started being in new environments that I've never been in. And how do I carry myself? How do I hold myself in these environments? But it also helped in my professional world. So when I was carrying myself through interviews and Mm -hmm. other areas of my life, I felt like I got a lot of skills that I was appreciative they were willing to share so much with us. Because they also did share a lot of their personal lives with us too. And they did the production crew as a whole. We really got to know them. and all of our lives were unfolding. And some of them, they had things going on in their personal lives. And then just all of us kind of really got to a place where I feel like in the end, it, it felt like we were with, among friends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then it confusing where we're like, oh yeah, we are just- you, We're just coworkers. You, yeah, we're just coworkers <laughs> in a way. Yeah. But, um, and then when it ended, it felt quite sudden for me, where I was like, where, uh, where are my people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. These have been my people for many years. For four years, right? Yeah. So like, and then all of a sudden, we're done. Because <laughs> it, it was wasn't so hard of a show to keep going. 
Yes, because it was so last minute. I felt like I was always keeping my life over open last minute. Mm. Even my kids' doctor's appointments, that's where my mother-in-law was taking them to those because I couldn't, or I would step away and do a FaceTime. Um, just so many things that last minute, being available and living your life like On that. Call. Yeah, it got that, really hard. It was, I was, so then I graduated law school, right? And then I start my career and that was in my interview. It was like one of the first things because I put, because I knew it was a public situation. So I couldn't be like, oh, here's my name and just assume they're not going to Google me. Yeah. Right. So I put on my resume, escaping polygamy, victim advocate. And I just put it in a way that was like a really empowering because yeah. it's like, it's my story. I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story. I want to tell it. It's going to be in my narrative. So, um, that was, it was on my resume and the partners like every one of them was like we're gonna make sure we meet this girl because there's no i had a pretty good like i had a good resume i had um, been at a federal judge like extern for a judge and i went to a really good law school and so i had really good summer like internships and so they were like okay and one of the first the things that they asked me is they're like can you um can you reassure us that well they were they're like what's going to be your priority is what they said what's going to mm. be your priority this um are you going to stop doing that i said no like i'm not stopping i'm going to do it as long as it's going um but they're like what would be your priority and so i was really clear with them i said i mean the reality is like this is my family so if somebody is leaving that is my family and i'm going to be there for it's going to be no different than somebody another you know employee or another person who needs to go help their family Mm-hmm. However, I will prioritize like this is my career, this is my future, so I this will be my priority, but I need you to like respect and understand like I'm not I'm not ending this. Yeah. And they were like, "Okay, like they were good with it." And then there were a, co- a few times that I ended up like I did film and um I remember I was writing a brief on the airplane. I had to get Wi-Fi. I had to like charge the client for Wi-Fi <laughs> so I could like do some research because it's trial coming up and I needed to do the trial brief. Um but they're like, "Yeah, whatever." Um yeah, so I just, I found a way. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I don't see like how I can carry on with the way I did it through law school because you can, yeah, like in it's my so, career, I was yeah. like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> yeah, so the timing ended up working out. <laughs> For my life, the timing was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about you? Yeah. What were the after effects of the show? Um, yeah, I think it was the same where it was like kind of abrupt, but I still did like, I was like, I still want them people in the order to know. I think it was scary because I was like, okay, so the show's ending and that means that um, everyone thinks we're not helping them anymore. Everyone thinks, you know, there's no more resources. Then I got a little bit freaked out and that's what kind of uh, made me jump into YouTube Mm -hmm. because I was like, maybe we can just continue this here. And it just felt like kind of like our voices were being, you know, stripped a little bit in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And maybe people were going to, I don't know. I think I got really in my head about it. Yeah, it was kind of confusing because of all the noise we were getting from so many directions. Yeah, and then it got scary. The order people like you guys are acting. It's all fake, and mm-hmm. then it shuts down. Yeah. Or even the access to the resource of being able to help people. Like when you we were doing it through the show, we did have access to more network money than using our own mm-hmm. financial money, yeah. and it went back to like, oh my gosh, I have to now pick up extra shifts. I've got to work. Like I haven't stopped helping people. It just mm-hmm. comes out of our personal pocket now. It's right. like, oh, you need help? Okay, yeah, let me go pick up an extra shift for work so, so I can, I can help cover you. your life. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's just been like that for the last pretty much since it shut down. Right. Yeah. I got yeah, I got a little scared though that that people weren't going to reach out as much because they didn't think they were going to get help. So I was like, if we just continue continue maybe on YouTube and just let them know we're still here. But then also I was like, there's still stories that need to be told. There still needs to be a platform for these people coming out that can tell their story in their own way, especially because the order is going to tell their story for them. Mm -hmm. So to give them a platform to where they can. And we did. We had one specific one was Jacob Swanson. Right when he left, he's like, can I please go on your channel so that I can say what really happened? And so to be able to give that back, it was, and I honestly, sometimes I feel a little bit like I am I was selfishly doing it because I was like, I got so much fulfillment over mm-hmm. time out of being able to feel heard and mm-hmm. feel like I'm getting a sense of community, which I guess that's not selfish. Everyone should be able to have that. <laughs> that's what life is supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. we were just taught to feel guilty about that. That's the sacrifice right. I'm talking about, the self-sacrifice. Mm-hmm. I don't need anything, I don't need anything. I just need to help everybody else. Right, and I, I feel like I keep saying that, but now that as my kids are growing up and I realize how much I've given to other people, I start to have this like internal guilt of like, am I giving that to my kids as well? Are my kids getting from me what I've been giving away? Yeah. Uh. And it's starting to hit me as they're hitting those ages. They're about to hit the age where 
I was when 12, I left, 15. yeah, 14 and 12, so about to be 12 and 15 and within like the next six months and I'm waiting and just, not just waiting, but ready to see what those unexpected emotions are gonna come up for me because you can't plan for them. They yeah. just surprise you. Your kid walks in the door and you're like, oh wow, this moment's happening right now. <laughs> yeah, we, we've been talking about every since they were like, McKinley was born, right? Of like, mm -hmm. oh look, they're like the same, like, a little yeah. brown and a little blonde and like their ages and we're like well you just wait till 2025 <laughs> there's so much my kids like the oldest one looks just like me the second one looks just like andrea personality wise just like me personality wise mm -hmm. just like andrea really? <laughs> yes even when she starts to struggle i'd be like um i think we need to call andrea on this one she's gonna have to give us some insights because you got you got a lot of her even yeah. when we went out to dinner and stuff, people would give Andrea the bill with her, her meal yeah. on it. <laughs> I know that, that one's baby. my kid too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> So it'll be interesting to see. And even too, I've hit some stages. I feel like over, over time, I've evolved differently in a lot of ways because of the show. And I really appreciate that experience. I'm not regretful mm -hmm. in any way. Um, sometimes I wish that I was more prepared for it or that I knew how to manage and handle different situations or what to do next when it suddenly stopped. Um, but I, I really appreciate where, how, just I, how I've been able to grow through all of it mm -hmm. and who I've become. And I felt like at one point I was like, wow, I think I've hit self-actualization. <laughs> I think we're there, yeah. this is what that feels like. But yeah. then hitting stages like the age my mom was when mm -hmm. I left and recognizing, oh my gosh, she was 32 with 11 children or 32, oh 33. I had so much more compassion and understanding um, that came into me and recognizing like, and calling Andrew being like, wow, mom did a lot for us. Like <laughs> things I didn't quite recognize or, yeah. oh, we had Christmas or, oh my gosh, Easter's coming up for my kids and oh, I just don't have the energy in me. And then I'm like, well, mom did it for 10 kids. So I just better <laughs> figure this out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like this stuff like that, that kind of helped. I feel like I have a lot more love that's come through me where I've been able to settle some of that hurt and anger in ways. There's still hurt and there's still frustrations. Mm -hmm. And then I guess I have one more thing I was gonna say about that is that I felt like when the show was ending, I had so much hope that the order really was changing. Mm -hmm. You know, you keep hearing All of you just laugh like, that's hilarious. So that I had that same hope. Nothing like, happened? <laughs> Four <laughs> years of what? For nothing. Well, because everyone kept telling us, they're like, it's changing, yeah, we're changing, it's, it's not the same. and. I was watching and looking from the yeah. outside in, obviously like getting further because before I had a closer seat and then it's like further, mm -hmm. further because they're kind of icing us out a little bit more now that we've been public and they can't be seen with us or mm -hmm. we're being watched. So their trust of reaching out to us is kind of lessening and just started hearing a lot that it was changing. The abuse was less and people had choice in marriage. And then now watching what we've been 10 more years and we're connecting with more people and hearing these stories. Okay, sure. The 14 year old's not wearing, marrying a 40 year old, but they're marrying another 18 year old who's also still being, you know, abusive or yeah. very similar behavior. Sure, they don't have old sweaty balls, but they're yes. still getting, you know, the abusive situation. The going sweaty on. balls vibe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's still there. Right. Um, I also had hope. And I I know it's a conflicting thing to have hope that the, the cult you left is going to, ch is changing. But I felt like exposing them and shining the light on the crap, it's forcing them to change. Like, I had, I hoped that it changed, that it would change for the better, but I knew damn well that a lot of the people, like what it changed was they did it more secretively mm -hmm. or yeah. they did it to this kid instead of that kid. The abuse changed sometimes to look a little differently where they mm -hmm. were messing with their lives more, cutting off access to resource, suddenly forcing them to move. I felt like I was really hopeful that there was gonna be like, okay, well maybe the order can be a better, safer place for people. It's not like, oh, at the time, like, oh, I hate all religions. The order needs to not be a religion. It was like, hey, let's be a decent religion. Let's do it better. Let's, you know, yeah. when someone doesn't want to be a part of it, if there's anything, if you really are so amazing, then why are you hiding so much truth? Just put mm -hmm. it all out there and people will choose Let it because it's so yeah. amazing. Yeah, informed mm -hmm. consent is a big thing. Like, it's fine if you want to be the way you are, but allow people to see the truth, see the history, know what's going on and let mm -hmm. them decide from there. And if they don't want to be a part of it, instead of cutting them off from their entire family, how about showing a little more Christ-like love if they're claiming mm -hmm. to be descendants of Christ, let's uh, <laughs> let's pretend like we're a little more like him. I know, I feel like they pulled in the scriptures of like, 
if thy right hand offend thee, cut, cut it, it off. Oh, they definitely <laughs> Is that what they used to yeah, cut off the right hand? Mm-hmm. Wow. And I yeah. feel like it's hard because the scriptures give so much hypocrisy or so much like back and forth. So you could pull anything you and can. shape it yeah, how you want exactly. it and it's going to work in your benefit. Yeah. Right. I mean, and other things too, like they're still doing the same things, just change it, um, renaming it or saying it's something else. Or, um, just actually last year, I overheard somebody on the phone with, an active order member and I don't know why they had on speaker but they oh sorry Oscar (laughs) but they had on speaker and I heard them say they don't have arranged marriages anymore but you can be 13 and know who you're supposed to marry and you can be engaged to be engaged Uh and so like I'm like we just did a different word do you not realize that this is the same thing and even at that age 100% that's grooming and coercion Mm -hmm. like why yeah, my own mom said the last like a month ago. Some parents call that abuse, but I call it parenting. And they these things. They, they, I'm like, do you hear yourself right now? <laughs> oh, well, you know what? If that's how you want to parent, then you're gonna get the result you're getting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, sorry. I just want to say, like, I remember when Daniel went to prison. Well, jail, whatever. When Daniel yeah. <laughs> went to prison. Well. Jail. Sorry. He went to jail. <laughs> when he, he got he out on the jail. weekend, he was behind bars. still slapped the kids <laughs> but, on the exactly. weekend. But for, <laughs> while for he was in jail abuse. for slapping kids. <laughs> yes, for child abuse. And a lot of the kids, and even the wives, I remember my mom saying, no, he's changed, he's changed. And I'm like, I don't believe it. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. Yeah. I don't believe it. But see, then I go to work with one of my half sisters and I see like, she's got, she's got a long sleeve shirt, but it's somewhat like, somewhat see-through. And I'm like, what is on your arm? And I see she's like bruised from top down to wrist and I'm like what the heck happened and she tells me about how Daniel beat the crap out of her and yeah her mom was right there watching it happen and did nothing and I'm like okay yeah see I knew it he didn't change he just learned who he can and cannot beat mm-hmm. and I can see the order doing the exact like the, exactly exactly that they're just realizing okay this feisty girl who's got an attitude sassy girl she should probably not see me beating the crap out of this kid over here mm-hmm. wow so even if a huge hit tv show that was on for four years can't get them to shape up, what do you think could actually affect real change in the group? That's a really good question. Because even saying another thing that my dad said was um, when I took to YouTube, he was like, why are you airing all of our dirty laundry? There was because people that- Because it needs to be cleaned. Yeah, Your I was like, yeah. I was like, my <laughs> there you go, Shalise. Flat out, I've been, and this is what I told my mom, because my mom's the one that relayed it to me. And I was like, "Tell you tell him, <laughs> since he doesn't want to talk to me, that if he's ashamed of what he's doing, maybe he shouldn't do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I, it's always my fault. Why, it's, t- let's turn the mirror it's to the you. The victim blaming. Yeah. yeah, it's my the fault for The other thing telling. on that note, I always tried to live my life in a way that if any of it went public, I would be okay with it. Yeah. That I had nothing to, like, yeah. I would take accountability. You're right. I made a mistake there. You're yeah. right. I could have done better. You know, I thought was you were such a good example. We did a live together one time and there was an ordered little girl, or I think it was a girl, that was like, Jessica was a bully in the order. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. And Jessica <laughs> just owned it. And she yeah. did such a good job explaining like, yeah, I was a bully. I was also bullied. And I think it took them, it shook them because in the order they like don't, they lack accountability. And then they thought you were gonna be like, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. And you were like, yeah, I was. Or even just like <laughs> completely give an excuse or explain it away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, know? I was a but, bully because you are a brat. <laughs> like, <laughs> you deserve that. You know, like it's not like that. Yeah. yeah, but I think the change question, that's a really good question. I do think obviously there what what we did made a pathway for the rest so it mm-hmm. did do good it's not like it didn't do anything but to hold these men accountable who are so stubborn on never being in the wrong there has to almost be just like forceful action because they're yeah. they've shown time and time again like even david going to prison and then get them saying that they he could potentially go back to prison if he's caught on parole you know, having sex with his sisters and he still was, that didn't right. stop him. Mm-hmm. So, and even he was trying to impregnate them while he was in prison. So it's like, at this point, we can't, we can't do anything. Mm-hmm. The state's going to have to do it or the, you know, mm-hmm. they're going yeah. to have to I think I kind of hit that point where it's, it's too big of a problem yeah. for me to be carrying this load alone. Mm-hmm. I think oh, yeah. I went through a lot of therapy to free myself of that responsibility. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. It is, it is not my responsibility to change this group, change this community that I happen to have been born into. I think my role is to put my own mask on, right? <laughs> and then exactly. to just be there for, for the ones that 
want, want the help. the change to, for a specific mm-hmm. individual, if they, in their own, because it is, it is so hard. It's, you can't just go grab them all and be like, okay, now go like be free, go live your right. life. Like mm-hmm. it's, they have to decide it. So like, I am here for the people who are choosing within themselves. Anything I'm going to individually do to change the system that existed long before I was mm-hmm. born. Um, it's well established. It's well resourced. It's well, you know, supported within the Utah community. And now it seems like around and everywhere. It just is like, it's like, no, it's, I don't think there's anything that I am personally responsible for doing or anything that I can do yeah. that is going to change the system as a whole. Yeah. And like, I'm- I it, don't think it is it's, what it is. I don't think it's any of your responsibilities. You've yeah. already done so much. I was wondering as a whole, like what, because people watching are going to be like, what can I do? You know, what can I do yeah. to help this? Is it just exposure and making people aware of this mm-hmm. that can make a difference and helping those, like you said, people who are in watch your channel say, oh, okay, there are ways that I can get out or there's life after yes. polygamy or whatever it is. But I guess my question on on like a deeper level, a second question is if someone watching this, maybe they live in Utah, maybe they actually know someone who's in the order, what can people actively do to help? Yeah, that's a really good question. Honestly, I think one of the biggest things that was kind of like a culture shock to me is just be kind. Because like we're growing up in such a prejudiced, abusive, manipulative world that everything like everyone and we're just used to people being mean and that was one of the biggest culture shocks that I like when I saw people just talking so kind to each other being being nice and actually going out of their way to help to just to help somebody without expecting something in in return or you know I just it when I look back or when I think about it it seems like such a silly thing to be a culture shock Mm -hmm. but I mean in in the group the kindness I don't know about you guys, but if anybody was ever nice to me, I was I was always wondering what's, right, what's coming up now, yeah. what's next, and like yeah. a Daniel especially, I'm like just knowing, okay, what now you're gonna try to get get me get married or something? I'm like I don't know what where this niceness is is coming from, but it's it either is mm-hmm. fake or it seems fake because I know better than to be trusting, trusting everybody mm-hmm. around me. Yeah, I feel like when I first left, I never I knew in my brain I was never gonna find a community ever again because. Uh, they just made it sound like that's not a thing out here, right? That no one's going to have, especially in there, it was like, well, no one has my back you here. You have to accept being yeah. alone. Yeah. And so then to see on on my YouTube, like I've cried so many times reading the comments on there of people who are just so like, I'll be your, pr- your proud mother. If your mom's Aww. not proud of you, I'm proud of you. Mm-hmm. And And seeing them give that same support to everyone that we've interviewed, I know that if it's affecting me in that healthy, positive way, it's got to be helping the the ones that are that have, you know, gone on the pedestal and and told their story and then being nervous of what's going to happen. But then they see this really positive, you know, comment section Mm -hmm. and people even going as far as messaging them to tell them like how, you know, it doesn't even have to be because I know some people are like, well, where can we donate to? Yes, obviously holding out help, right? The ones that have helped us. And that was great. But I think even it's just those little things of seeing these strangers supporting us more than our own family. Mm -hmm. See, guys, that's why the comment section matters. It does. Every episode, <laughs> they like, read it. Those too. words of encouragement because our guests read the comments. And you never know what comment could make or break someone. If you're leaving a negative comment, you know, they read that too. So just be really conscious of your words and show kindness because it can really change someone's life. I also feel like um, something that in hindsight, I didn't realize it at the time, but now looking back, there were so many people that would come and meet me or try to give me information that their religion was a better option. Mm-hmm. I was often trying to be sold another religion or often trying to be like, hey, this, you know, being a Mormon is not that bad or, oh, we can do it better or um, just trying to they were trying to do it like they would approach me in like a loving way. Like we want to take you in and we want to. Yeah. And then I would start going down these paths and I would realize I am not anyone's project. And me going from this religion to this religion is not going to heal my trauma and suddenly help me have a better relationship with the yeah. idea of God. Mm-hmm. And then I started to think about, you know, the whole like commandments with the Ten Commandments of Moses and whatnot, and the whole don't take the Lord's name in vain. It started to really feel like I just kept hearing people constantly using God's name to manipulate me or to get mm-hmm. me to do something or to bring me into some new fold or, oh, come join our club. And I finally just was like, 
I don't want to be in any of your guys' heavens anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I want my right own here. heaven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Respecting your decisions and just, I feel like that's a really good point because we do see that a lot in the comments. And I know it comes from love. People are like, oh, find Jesus or you need to do this or go to this church. And I, I know it's because they have a positive experience and they want to share that positive experience, but that's not always what the guest needs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like we just had a, a woman um, from ultra Orthodox. She was Jew or is Jewish and she was from ultra Orthodox Judaism. And the comments were like, find Jesus. And she's like, that doesn't help me. I'm yeah, Jewish. Right. Like, can we leave those comments aside? Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I think that's a good point. Um, still reaching out with love and acceptance without trying to provide a solution. Right. Just saying, I'm here, I see you, I understand you, I'm here for you is so powerful in itself. And then if you do make a one-on-one connection, like you become really good friends, then sure, like offer what has worked for you. But I think that's a great point if you are trying to be helpful to strangers, just offering love and support is enough. Well, and everyone's like experience with, you know, the whole idea of Jesus is very different. Yeah. Like I've kind of hit a point where people are like, well, Jesus forgives you. And I'm like, I'm kind of at the point where in the afterlife with God and Jesus, like they they can ask for my forgiveness at this point. Like I kind of feel like I've lived enough yeah. in life and seen enough that I'm like, we can have that conversation if there's yeah. an afterlife. Yeah. But when people say find Jesus, it's just it hurts mm-hmm. in like a tinge of like, Oh, so this is not a real raw relationship. This is I'm your, I'm your missionary um, experience. I'm your to do list. I'm your now. You can go home and feel good and be like, I did what I was supposed to. What my leaders told me to do. And yeah. I think just for some it might be that, but it also it could be what you're saying. Like it enlightened them so much, so they want to share that light with you, but it doesn't do that for you. And I've tried mm-hmm. to take it at that face value because I've had so many people like, Jesus loves you, da da da, and I, I'm like, thank you, but it's <laughs> it's definitely not giving me the praise the Lord that they <laughs> want me to have, you know? Mm-hmm. Exactly, but but when they say find Jesus, I mean we found him sitting on the wall right behind. The, the, right leader. the leader right behind, <laughs> right behind Paul, Paul at church. Like, <laughs> like where is Jesus? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, it's like they, they have they have the picture there. So like it could be insensitive too to be like triggering, be like literally visuals. I found mm-hmm. him right there in church, yeah. in that abusive yeah. world, in the cult, all yeah. around that. Mm-hmm. And, and it's almost like they're telling you to go back. Because as far <laughs> as I knew, that was the best Jesus. <laughs> and that was yeah. the most righteous church, so. And we were related to him. Yeah. The whitest Jesus. <laughs> we were related oh my to gosh. him. Oh, my gosh. Sometimes it's like when people are trying to help. And I get, I try to see through that. And I try not to just take it as an opportunity to be like, oh, here's your education for you. And just move past <laughs> it. And let's just move forward. And I recognize that we are in a world where there are so many people who are part of a religion. They were lucky enough to have a positive experience with it. And I'm happy for them. And I don't want to change that for them. But I've hit a point where I've tried and there's no way for me to have a positive experience with religion mm-hmm. do you, for what I can see for myself right now. Do you ever get jealous of other people's like strength? Ignorance. Yeah, well the I'm strength. <laughs> what did you say? Ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> the ignorance is this. No the the <laughs> yeah. Oh, straight. You're right. Both. Both. Right <laughs> oh my I god. Like you guys. <laughs> well, like they 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 pull strength, or, or it's almost like false strength. Yeah. But they can co- go through all these really hardships in life because you know Jesus is walking with them. And uh, there's been times where my adopted sister, the way she talks about it, and I'm like, how have you gone through all of these things in your life? And she's like, I just know that Jesus is with me through it. And I'm like, I wish I had that in my back pocket. You know? I was just thinking thing. with Chanel's comment, like somebody could could twist it to say, yeah, Jesus was there holding you up that whole time while you were sitting there. It's like, that's not how I experienced it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I experienced right? it like yeah. I my, inti- my internal power. I yeah. was there with myself. Mm-hmm. I got myself through. I am so much stronger than I even knew and i'm always there for myself yeah that's another and thing i also see i have an inner higher power of some yeah. sort I, we, i'm a god but <laughs> i'm your own god <laughs> we talked about this on my uh cult a cup of coffee does the belief of god kind of make you not like you're giving the credit all to god and then all of the failure is yours you know you don't give yourself that credit of i got myself through that I was the one that pulled myself out of all of that. You know, mm-hmm. there's all this accountability and, you know, um, patting yourself on the back that you should be proud. But a lot of the times I think there's that that wavering of like, um, 
no, God got you through all of that stuff and all the bad stuff as well. And then on the flip side, with there being an adversary or a Satan, then nobody takes accountability for their harmful behaviors. Mm -hmm. They were just tempted. Mm -hmm. Satan just has a stronghold on them. They're not who they are. And who am I? (laughs) Yeah. Like, Daniel didn't do what he did. Satan got him. Yeah, Yeah, I know know that, um, and we do have a lot of Christian followers, and again, we're not saying that believing one way or another is wrong. Uh, We're just talking about our own personal experiences Mm -hmm. and how we internalize things, and I feel like that's completely valid, and we should be talking about that so people have awareness. The thing that bothers me about, well, Jesus is the one that got you out is what about the people who didn't get out? Right, like, were they not Jesus love? not yeah. love them? <laughs> yeah. Or like, yeah. well, you know, they were being tested. Or Okay, so now we're still, we're putting the blame on Jesus for wanting to give a test to this person when in mm-hmm. reality, it was the perpetrator who was hurting them. It, it wasn't mm-hmm. some sort of like divine, in my opinion, mm-hmm. it wasn't a, a divine thing. And so I think that's where we also need to be careful or people who are pushing that on others, the like Jesus loves you mm-hmm. is, know what the opposite means to some people and how that can also be very harmful to some to victims and survivors Mm -hmm. i I never hear people be like oh we were being tested to to me that just sounds like a domestic violence relationship and i'm not i was gonna say that too (laughs) in a dv relationship with god yeah yeah (laughs) does it make sense he's like my toxic boyfriend or something yeah (laughs) like that's how it feels like no No, thanks. Yeah. So with all of that, to wrap this up, I know everyone wants to know how you guys are doing after the show. Just like we always see in the comments, we want updates on what happened to these girls because they all loved you and they followed you. And so if you guys just want to say like a few positive things or even some of the difficult things, whatever you want to share about how you're doing and where you're at in life. Well, I'm divorced now. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone's everyone watched me get married on the show at 18 and then. Seven years later, I filed for divorce at 25 and moved out of Utah and never looked back. <laughs> so yeah. I'm happy now. Um, I think we all we're all in stages where we obviously are never going to stop progressing. We mm-hmm. want to keep growing. And I think that the hardest thing for me right now is to be OK with not necessarily knowing how how I'm going to figure out the end result, you yeah. know, be OK with the unknown. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are you still a lawyer? Oh, uh, (laughs) that's the most, you've seen those comments, right? No, I never, never have I ever even wanted to be a lawyer. But has people said, how's your marriage? Have people said that to you? She didn't have social media. I don't talk to people. Oh, so you never had that. You know that that's part of why I got the purple streaks was to be like, I'm Amanda, that's Andrea. Really? But it didn't do anything. Everyone still thought we were the same person. And (laughs) and there was people that were like, I totally thought they were the same person until they got in that episode together. (laughs) Because we did one episode together, which was Lauren's Escape. Blew everyone's mind. Yeah, they're They're like, like, there's two of them. (laughs) And it's like, you have blue eyes and I have green eyes too. But I can totally see that we all look alike for sure. Yeah, yeah. But so what's your your afterlife story? Me? Yeah. The, uh, lo- the lawyer. This the is the life, lawyer. Life after, not your afterlife. Life we're not there after. yet. <laughs> yeah, my afterlife. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. But. I know all the chapters of my life. I feel like I've, I've gone through so many chapters in my life. But my life now after the show is over. Um, I am a lawyer. I am actually a lawyer. And I <laughs> wanted to be a lawyer since I was 13. Um, and I am now. Um, I, I'm i just living. I mean, I'm enjoying just living life. And just like I spend a lot of, um, you know, just like building my own practice and doing what, what I want to do with my time and with my efforts and, and my energy. And um, I do estate planning, um, estate planning and then probates and trust administration. I did four years of litigation, which was, it was really good. It was a really good learning experience, but I had a really good opportunity at the firm I was, that, you know, interviewed me and they gave me the job. Um, I made partner, which was wow. pretty great. Yeah, I made partner quicker than I thought I was going to. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, it was a really, really great opportunity. And then, um, so I've been a partner three years now. Um, but with that, I have really been kind of reflecting a lot on like, why is estate planning, why am I so, so drawn to that? And something that I really, like from this retreat that we were doing, that we've been doing, just like all the girls that we've met, um, and just hearing their stories, I'm like, oh my God, like that's that's what it is. It's the empowering of like, you can plan your legacy, you can plan your life, who's in charge of your finances, who's in charge of your healthcare decisions, what's gonna happen to your stuff when you die. It's, it is your decision and yours alone. 
And like, I feel like, like I'm taking, you know, I see as I talk to all the girls here, I'm like, oh my gosh, everyone needs to stay fun. But um, <laughs> I'm like, wow. Like, so that's what I'm doing, you know, in my own, my own way. Um, and I am married. I, um, so we're, you know, happy, happily married. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, we've been together like all through the show. <laughs> um, we were, we met in college and I was, you know, we were together the whole time. I focused my, like that part of my life was secure. And so I focused on um, school and the show and all of that. And I was like, okay, now I feel like I'm actually an adult. And I remember talking to people like, you know, when we were, we were talking about producers being like, oh, like, how's that going? And I'm like, I'm waiting until the day I look like an adult because I have such a young <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it didn't come, but um, so <laughs> I ended up getting, uh, so, yeah. Anyway, and yeah, you know, that's, that's me. Awesome. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I've been enjoying living a cult free life and raising my daughters in a world where I don't have to worry about my, like their uncles or their cousins trying to, yes, them. Yeah. yes. And to, and raising them in, in a world where they can actually be spirited. Like I, I'm a firm believer that a spirited child has a, or no, a wild child a wild child has a spirit that needs blooming, not breaking. And I like every time I, I see my kids' spirit and like their sass and like, I'm just like, that's right, girl. You have a voice. Use it. <laughs> Use it. Yes, that's awesome. I kind of feel like I'm just still trying to manage it all. Like, you know, <laughs> I just never place. stopped. <laughs> like, it's just, um, you know, have the family life, spouse and healthy relationship and then continuing to try to be like, okay, where do I want to go in life? I'm always like passionate about advocacy. I start heading in those directions. Um, I like to face things I'm afraid of. So I was afraid of working. Um, I guess I got my master's in social work mostly because I wanted to understand, you know, the psyche, the human psyche. I want to understand why do people do what they do? What helps motivate people? Um, what's the motivation for change and how to help promote and foster change that's, that people want for themselves, not that I'm trying to manipulate them myself. And that's what drew me through like my degree. And then just, okay, I'm afraid of working with people who have psychosis. Jumped in that world, felt like, okay, I'm confident with that. I'm afraid of working with people who are suicidal. I don't know how to help this. I don't know how to manage it. Jumped in that world. And I'm a crisis social worker in the ER and a community crisis social worker and a trauma social worker. Um, now I'm starting to see that there's a, a struggle where kids are not having, um, they don't have a voice in Utah with the way the laws are mm. currently. And so I, they don't have access to different things. It's harder to get them access if the parents don't take them. They don't get access to their mental health. Parents are already busy. There's just not enough time. So just trying to, you know, I see very macro and I see these deficits or where there's um, gaps in the system and how do I get there? What can I make a difference there? And not just in the world of polygamy, but really just in the world of any child, any woman, any minority. Um, and I still like white men too, <laughs> but <laughs> just yeah. trying to help so that people have access. Yeah. Or if there's a resource, because a lot of times there's a resource and there's a person who needs a resource but they don't find each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. How do we help definitely. them find each other? Mm -hmm. How do we yeah. help the person with the resource get the news out that they have a resource and the person who has a need know where to look? Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thanks guys for coming on. It's been yeah. so great. I love hearing from all of you and what you're doing and I love collaborating. If you guys ever want to share something on my platform, you're welcome to. Uh, maybe we'll get an interview with you guys later if you want to. Um, <laughs> but this has all been so awesome and I know our audience has been dying to hear from you guys. Can I ask you a question before okay. we end? Because sure. you are the only like outsider that got to come in and see this retreat with uh -huh. 20 plus women from these cults. What was your uh, outsider looking in fly on the wall mm -hmm. perspective of it I think it was interesting watching the dance between the different levels of I don't think healed is the right word the different levels of exposure to the outside world and where everyone was at personally 
and see how they kind of interacted with each other, see how they bloomed in certain ways and shined in certain ways. And I feel like all of it came together so well. There was no fighting. Everyone was just laughing and smiling and trying to include everybody. Uh, I think the moment, go watch Amanda's channel. I don't know where you're going to post it, but the video you did on the beach last night where you started by yourself and then you came after, right, and joined, and then you came after and joined, and then all these women came, and it was just such a beautiful representation of paving the way and finding community and sisterhood that I actually teared up, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to ruin the moment. Yeah, I'm I, like crying on the sidelines. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because I was like, am I, I on my period? Is that why I'm crying? Because it was so, to me, it was, I was like, it's yeah. so, yeah. And it, this year and the last time we did this, I had the same thought of like, Oh, I hope that like all these girls can get along, but but we all did. And we all were I think that having that community just really gives gives every single individual one of us to be like, "Oh, I'm not alone." Yeah, we and do I have think each other. You meet each other where they are. Mm -hmm. So no one's expecting anyone to be a certain way. It's just, "Oh, I see you and I see what you need and let me be there for you." And it was just so beautiful to see how all of you guys interacted with everybody and how the other people were obviously lighting up in your presence and like, oh, this is so fun and talking to you and kayaking and flipping over and like yeah. <laughs> all of the fun activities that you guys planned. I think it was just such a beautiful way to come together. And as there's like a gaggle of gorgeous women walking down the beach, I see everyone walking by like, what is this going on? And I wanted to be like, they all have polygamous cults and they're badasses, but I didn't. But I wanted to, to be like, yeah, they're doing a thing. It's not just a bunch of chicks on the beach. It's like, they're it's doing a powerful, thing. you know, it's amazing for me to watch because I didn't come from anything nearly as oppressive or hard and so it's just really cool to watch all of you guys come together it's beautiful Thank that's you. that's a good yeah. perspective <laughs> I'm glad I asked yeah, I kind of feel like a lot of that too where at I feel like I'm the big sister of a lot of these girls mm -hmm. you literally in a lot of way, right <laughs> but just feeling so proud and so um like just you go girl you be you mm -hmm. and then seeing that that idea or that representation where it was just us mm -hmm. for a long time yeah and then yeah. there was others out there but not like a closeness mm -hmm. and not a community or a place to go and the community like it's still we're still trying to figure it out it's constantly evolving it's not like oh if you leave right now and you join our community we're all going to be there for you 24 7 but yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Never sort through. <laughs> but I think it's also because you're not required to be there for anyone, right? Because you have your own lives, put your own mask on first. But I think more than anything, you're living by example. And that's mm -hmm. so powerful. Just being able to share your experiences and say, this is what worked for me, it might work for you. Or this is how I've been able to come out on the other side and I'm living happy and peaceful, I think is so important for people to see. So just being you is mm -hmm. so awesome for people leaving or trying to leave. And not mm. that this whole like journey is always all about me, but <laughs> there is but. Some, there's some times where after we filmed that I had a lot of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Embarrassment when it all like kind of shut down and there was just like, I, what did I do? And did I really honor everybody? I lost my voice in some ways where I, you know, we wasn't able to protect some people in the end the way I wanted to or having so many people on the outside and fans reaching out, recognizing that people are filming me from far away in the grocery store and then looking down mm. and being like, oh, no. maybe I should pay attention to this a little bit more. Um, just, I don't know, people are like, oh, she's she's TV star and feeling embarrassed that I started to hide that. Mm -hmm. And I hid that where I worked for a while, it came out, everyone's like, oh, wow, why didn't you never tell us? Why would I tell you? Why is that important information? And then just trying to figure what out what that looked like. Yeah. Like, how do I accept all of me and let all of me be present, but not have it come out to be overwhelming or the topic of the conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to be known aside from mm -hmm. what you've done in the past, even though I'm sure you're proud of it and helping so many people, but mm -hmm. you don't want to be defined by that moment in your life. So I can understand mm -hmm. wanting to keep it separate. And then also feeling like, did it really even make that much of a difference? And then you meet these girls who are out and they're like, thank you for putting that out there publicly. We wouldn't have access to the information otherwise. Wow. It helped us realize that we had rights, that we yeah. could stand up for ourselves, that if we left, something would happen or someone would say something. And hearing that really helped settle a lot within myself. Mm -hmm. Not that any of them owed it to me, but I, <laughs> I do appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yeah, I just want to say that we did find out on this trip that at at least one of the rallies, the one of the polygamous rallies where we went to, where it's us girls on one mm-hmm. side being like, no, polygamy was very harmful. This it, it is abuse. This is what it destroyed our family. Then some of the girls that were here on this trip were also there as the little kids, uh, the like as side. kids on the other <laughs> side, wow. as polygamy, polygamy. As polygamy yeah. you know, advocating for polygamy, at least like just visually mm-hmm. and and standing there thinking but what if i agree with them talking about us mm-hmm. yeah. and what we're saying about polygamy mm-hmm. wow that's crazy mm-hmm. that's so cool yeah. well any other final thoughts that we didn't touch on or anything yeah. you want to say before we go we got to do a linda listen i didn't prepare any of you for this if you have a sassy statement that you want to say that would be great and just say linda listen so like if i had one it would be Linda, listen, you cannot hold these women down. They are forces of nature and good luck trying. (laughs) I liked your, um, then wash your dirty laundry. (laughs) Linda, listen, wash your laundry if you don't want me to air it. Yeah, Yeah. seriously. You got one? Well, I feel like I already said it. I'll just repeat it. But uh, a wild child has a spirit that needs blooming, not breaking. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have one? I do have one. Children should be seen, heard, and believed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, 100% all of those things and then also I loved what you were saying with your estate planning that it's your life you decide and then also trust yourself you're the one who's carried you through this many days so far you'll get you through your next days too yeah Mm -hmm. just show up See if you guys can pull out something out last minute. That was great. <laughs> so uh, Amanda here has her own channel. If you haven't watched it, where have you been? Go watch it right now. Um, Amanda Ray. We'll link everything in the description. Yeah, and if these ladies want their social media handles put out there, we'll put those in the description as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that's it. Thank you again. You guys are great. Yes, I love making all these new friends. <laughs> and if you're watching, leave those comments, those words of encouragement down below. We love them and we've already expressed why they're important. So I don't need to go into it again <laughs> and you can become a patron at patreon.com slash to consciousness or check out our merch at calls to consciousness.com and if you like this video i'll link two more i don't know where they'll be down here below because it's a new frame and until next time follow your highest excitement be conscious and be well <laughs>